Thank you for that um, very nice introduction. Um, I'm going to tell you about um, data mining. I've done data mining most of my career. Back in the 60s, as a graduate student, we were trying to explain molecular things with one or two experimental values. Then we started looking at protein structures when we had 30 some proteins and trying to understand the interactions among the generality of those interactions among those proteins. And now we have several hundred million protein sequencing sequences. And so it's uh, like the, the ultimate dream to have that much data to try to understand. And so I'm going to tell you about two different things today. One is um, trying to improve sequence matching. Um, and the second is to improve homolog detection down to the 20% level. Uh, typically, um, homolog detection by standard sequence matching uh, gets down to the 30% sequence identity level. So this is, uh, we believe, a significant advancement, and it lets you um, identify functions of many proteins that previously had no identified functions. So um, one of the problems with sequences, if you think about the fact that some of these sequences have evolved over 4 billion years, it means that uh, the similarity between sequences of today's organisms and those of 4 billion years ago may be impossible to detect. Um, there's also um, the idea that in many organisms that there are unique proteins. And um, one of the uh, recent studies has shown that, that that's not usually the case. It's a failure in the detection methods for those relationships. And so um, we have lots of needs for sequence matching. It's, um, I uh, spent a long time at the NIH and uh, we had constantly people coming in to want to do sequence matching. That was by far the biggest uh, demand by the experimental biologists for any computations. And so BLAST has been phenomenal what it's been able to accomplish and how well-sighted it is too. So anyway, uh, we think that um, these advances, particularly in the homolog detection using linguistic models um, uh, is an important thing because it becomes efficient. The sequences are reduced in the way we use them. Uh, it's almost like principal component analysis where you reduce the sizes of the sequences and this means you can match whole genomes uh, typically within minutes, so uh, which is important for um, the future of biomedicine, genomic-based medicine. So um, the usual sequence matching is based on amino acid similarities, but if you think about the dense protein structures, things don't happen independently, and so by accounting for the interdependences in those substitutions, you often see a pair of interacting residues that flip or otherwise change. And so accounting for those, uh, adding those into a substitution matrix lets you make many gains in, in protein sequence matching. Then I mentioned the linguistic models in the second part and both of the, and putting these things together is particularly useful. So in the case, so this is how we improve the sequence matching. You have these exchanges like a K inter a lysine interacting with a glutamic acid flipping. You have other changes that are similar but um, substitutions. And so from looking at the multiple sequence alignment, you get the correlations in the columns, how they change when one changes, it always changes in the other column. Those kinds of correlations are key to doing this. And so in, in that way, you can identify other substitutions within those columns. And by putting those into the substitution matrix, you get, um, this is another description of this uh, type of uh, analysis. So, um, and then there are different ways that people have analyzed the multiple sequence alignment to get the correlations. Um, there's 
the most the simplest way is really this uh, mutual information, which is which is almost like a conditional probability, and uh, that's the version that we're usually using. There's the one um, uh, direct coupling analysis from uh, Marx and Sander, um, which has been widely applied for uh, detecting contacts in the structures. So this is what we do. We add back into the substitution matrix. And this and it, and it doesn't make that many changes to the structure. You know, BLAST uses its default Blossom 62 matrix. And so on the right hand side, it shows the changes between our pro sub uh, matrix and the Blossom 62 matrix. And it's not huge changes, but it lets you uh, make big gains. For instance, there are 2002 cases where the structures are virtually identical but the sequence matches don't agree. And so this is one case where um, we show this. And so, you know, the, in the sequence alignment, you get um, the same piece of sequence match aligned perfectly. And so that's what's true in the structure alignment too. And so comparing between the sequence alignments and the structure alignments is important for this. And so, uh, and this is true, you know, with sequence matching, there's always the issue of the gap penalties. And we've shown that um, you always do better with this type of substitution than you do with um, um, Blossom 62, for instance. Um, this lets us uncover many new functions from the sequence matching and much more specific functions. You know, the gene ontology, uh, has terms that are virtually useless. It's an enzyme, or it's in the cytoplasm, or, you know, really useless stuff. Uh, but we get down to much uh, more specific functions. And so we um, looked at HIV proteins because there are only nine proteins, and so you can look at the function. And so we get many more things that um, relate to function that are much more specific than before. So one of the important uses for protein sequences and protein structures is to understand function. Uh, admittedly, um, comparing sequences, uh, you could imagine is somewhat limited because um, you may have the function that depends only on three amino acids at an enzyme active site, but yet um, it's surprisingly effective. And so this shows the the improvements in the um, sequence matching for the HIV proteins and um, the uh, graph on the right shows the ones that are more specific and the one on the left are the ones that we lose that are not as specific as with Blossom 62. So, um, uh, and, and we've scanned the literature for validation of many of these cases and find that, that most of them are validated. Okay, the second part I'm going to talk about is uh, PROST, which is our protein ortholog sequence tool. And um, this is based on a um, linguistic model that was developed at Facebook. And so, you know, we're in the era now of where Google and Facebook are almost like public utilities. And so it's um, interesting to me so, uh, culturally that we have this kind of thing going on. But we, we found uh, it's an absolutely wonderful tool. This is a paper that appeared in PNAS and last year. First author is Rebus, R-I-B-E-S, is what we built on. And so it's, it's a... Um, so uh, just background a little bit. Um, we have 225 million protein sequences in Unipro knowledge base. Um, we need evolutionary information to annotate from the multiple sequence alignments. Um, we often have more than a third of um, the genes in a given organism with unknown functions. And so um, 
in that issue, um, this is a paper by uh, by uh, John Eddy uh, saying you have many but not all lineage specific genes can be explained by homolog detection of that. And so I think that's uh, an important conclusion. And we find, so I'm going to skip this. We all know how BLAST uses short pieces of sequence. And that has the deficiency that you don't capture the long range interactions that are present in the structures. And so that's one of the advantages of this linguistic model. We uh, use uh, cosine functions that capture some of that long range information. And so that enables the, the a greater reduction in those sequences that enables the large scale sequence matching. So these are so-called transformer deep learning models. Um, and um, they, they um, are highly efficient in part because the sequencers are represented by a very small vector and you pre-compute the database of large numbers of proteins to compare against. And so you simply you're taking the difference between vectors to identify uh, the best um, ortholog. This is the linguistic sort of um, training that, that you do with this model. You have sequences, you delete part of it and, and train it so that it adds that, but in this case, boring. Uh, the movie is very, and you delete boring, and you, and you train the model to pick boring for that next sentence, next word. Um, so, um, it won't go. I'm stuck. I was, is it stop sharing or hide? I guess I just say hide, right? Is that what I do? All right, so what these people in this PMAS paper in 2001 did, first off at Rebus, was to show that you could use this model to look at the characteristics of amino acids, the slide on the left. You can use it to look at um, um, secondary structures, to predict, predict secondary structures. And so what we're doing is an extension of this to, to apply. And so this shows for instance, on the right-hand side, these are this last slide and this slide are figures from their paper. And um, the upper half of this contact map on the right is the usual correlation predicted contacts. The red ones are wrong, the blue ones are right, um, and the lower part is their prediction of contacts. So it, it significantly improves that prediction, their method. Um, so, what this consists of is using this ES1B protein language model that's been trained to produce these different layers of embedding, and then we apply this cosine quantization in that third step, and in the last, uh, you get these vectors that are representative of the sequence. And the compression is very similar to um, JPEG reductions or whatever. Um, this is the IDCT uh, quantization that we use. So, um, and so these are these are the results. So, we have pairs of sequences. In each case, for each of these data sets, for the PFAM, Gene3D, and Superfamily, we have around 5,000 sequence pairs. And so, um, you test your methods to see whether you can pick those right pairs. And so our method gave 97% with PFAM, 98.9% with area under the curve for Gene3D and 98.5% for superfamily set. And so these, these are, if you compare with the other methods, it doesn't look like a huge gain, but in reality, it enables you to um, find an ortholog for almost every protein sequence. So, um, whereas uh, many of the others uh, fail. So, what we have done beyond what these um, 
uh, Facebook people did is to optimize the process for um, sequence identity, sequence matching. And so it, the model has uh, different numbers of layers. And so uh, this shows the area under the curve. It's a type of layer I see. Um, and we get best results for those two uh, black dots uh, at, for those two layers. And so those are the two layers that we use in our optimization. And um, the remarkable thing is how small uh, the, these are. And so uh, Swiss Pro has 585, 565,000 um, sequences. Um, it reduces to um, 0.25 gigabytes and it takes uh, half a second to start. So, and if you, and, and these, since you're just subtracting vectors, it's easily parallelizable. So um, you can get it down to milliseconds, those kinds of searches. So let me show you some of the results now. So this is for the model um, shown at the top. And um, the other thing that we get is repeated functions. So when we do the sequence matching, we may get 10 uh, identical uh, function matches. So this is another way that um, strengthens the confidence in your results, I think. Um, so this is applying this linguistic model to find um, the match between these two sequences. And uh, then we use structures to validate those matches. So in this case, um, it's a sequence identity of 23%, and the two structures are shown on the right. Um, we're using often the alpha fold structures where we don't have crystal structures. Um, and this may be particularly pertinent for disordered proteins, of which there are large numbers. Um, so, so the identification of these two sequences are shown here, and then we use this pro sub substitution matrix to do the sequence alignment itself. So we're using both of these approaches here. So we get, um, and I talked about the multiple uh, cases. So um, blast results are shown on the right, uh, and so in this case you have. Uh, 30, I'm sorry, 28% that have 10 or more uh, similar functions, uh, homologs. And instead of 28%, we get 64%. So even though those results I showed before are relatively, look like small gains, you nonetheless actually see pretty large gains when you start to apply. So, um, so in the, um, um, Swiss pro human proteins, there are 864 that show no function. And so last with blossom 62 uh, gets some sequence match for 65%. And we get sequence matches for 96%, many of which are much more specific than the blast ones. Here's an um, open reading frame. Uh, 204 um, and uh, is known to interact with nucleolin and ribosomal RNA. Um, and so uh, it matches with somatotropin, which is a growth hormone. And um, it makes sense that it increases the number of ribosomes. So, uh, you know, these kinds of, and there's the structure agreement on the right where one is blue and one's red. So uh, we believe that um, this sort of thing. Uh, this is another case uh, where we have the structure match on the right, the sequence match on the left. And so it looks like this protein is an ASCH domain containing ribonuclease. So, you know, it's, it's much more specific. We um, have interacted with the people at the Jerry Curry Venter Institute, John Glass, and um, so I have Ruthie Schulten, uh, University of Illinois, 
they have a number of um, those um, 149 out of their 500 or so um, genes that have no known function. And so we actually get function for all of those. And they had uh, laboriously um, found functions for a few of those that agreed with what we found. So um, that was an interesting interaction. Um, um, so um, doing the annotation uh, is, is important. And this is just some background of people that have been um, working in that area, which is not something we were particularly familiar with before we start, started on this project. So, um, you know, I have a huge number of examples of these things. In fact, we have a, um, a database we've started um, of the functions and such. Um, so this is um, shows here, if you look at the top four, um, five cases, they're all magnesium transporting ATPase. So this is a new uh, identification for that particular gene or protein. Um, this is another one. Uh, and you know, you can look at the TM fault, uh, score between the proteins uh, structures uh, to try to validate whether or not you're on the right track or not. And uh, so this is an example, another example of, in this case, we have six that are a uh, large ribosomal RNA subunit accumulation protein. Not quite, I don't know what an accumulation protein means, but anyway, <laughs> that seems to be the consensus uh, from this method. Uh, here's a case that's um, quite disordered. It's an uncharacterized protein from that minimal organism. And so um, these are the two structures from alpha fold. So, even though um, it's probably uh, um, a lot of those structures are identified with low confidence in, in alpha fold, uh, they nonetheless have some significant similarity. I'm going to skip a lot of this stuff. I don't, how am I doing for time? I didn't look. Uh, you ten have ten more minutes. Ten more minutes for questions and everything, right? Uh, ten more minutes between the questions, but we can shorten it between the questions. Okay. Um, because you have your I mean, so another thing that we have started on is trying to use uh, these sequence matching scores for the homologs that we identify to uh, derive phylogenies. And um, we have a new collaborator for, for trying to do that. And so, um, and, and we see um, when, this is very initial stuff, we're just now starting it. So, you know, trying to understand uh, uh, the, this is different yeast, um, looking at there. Uh, and this was together with Edward Brown at the University of Florida. And so um, we think it, it's going to lead to something quite interesting, but we're just now starting to really some. Uh, we looked at um, the relationship among different strains with the coronavirus. Is, um, one of the uh, last points that I want to make is that fact that you can use sequences now not only to predict contacts in the, for the structures, but you can use them directly for the dynamics. If you have very reliable contact predictions from the sequence correlations, then you can um, use those in the dynamics. And this is a, a one case of um, glutamine binding protein where there are two crystal structures, one in an open form and one in a closed form. And so in the sequence correlations, the contacts that are formed in the, the um, closed form are present too. So if you had only the open structure, you could use this in principle to predict what the dynamics is to close that structure to form the closed form. Um, this is you know, it's a little bit abstract to think about uh, jumping past structures and going directly from sequence to dynamics. So it's not quite clear to me how you're going to use this. But, um, and, you know, maybe it's just a trivial exercise. But, and the reason this is feasible is uh, because of the uh, elastic models that are based 
only on the contacts. You use the contact matrix to derive the normal modes for the, the dynamics. And so uh, if you have high quality correlations, you can go directly from the sequences. So anyway, so, but you start to think about the generality of this too. And if you use um, sequences that are clearly from one uh, family of structures, then you can get presumably the dynamics, the general dynamics for that family. Uh, but um, we haven't done much on this yet. But another thing that we're doing that um, is particularly interesting is looking at higher order correlations. So, you know, all this so far as everybody's doing is based on pairs. But in the dense, dense protein, you have many more interactions than just pairs. And so um, we have um, been looking initially at transfer RNA because there are so many sequences. We have, I, I forget what, it's 120 million or 140 million sequences. So it's, all, it's a wonderful test bed for testing these uh, statistical procedures for extracting the higher order correlations. And immediately from that set of sequence alignments, we get um, the base triplets that are present in this structure. And so, but it lets us uh, play on this test bed with to figure out which statistical metric is best for extracting these higher order correlations. And so you immediately, of course, get the usual base pair. Um, um, th this is like um, going back in ancient history to Carl Wolves, who um, made the first structure predictions on RNA based on um, matching segments of sequence that would pair in, um, with one another, which is obviously a sequence correlation. All right, so in summary, this approach that we have um, submitted a publication for is quite different from any other previous um, homolog detection method. And uh, it's very effective and efficient for doing <clears throat> this homolog dete ortholog detection. It has linear run times. It's and, and it's, um, for instance, Swiss pro with the 585,000 protein sequences. To search against that, it takes 522 milliseconds on a uh, rather standard uh, pro single process. So this means that you can really do uh, whole genome sequence matching, which is absolutely critical for genome-based medicine. Um, and these are the websites that we, um, we have for this um, ortholog detection. And, and an older bio-archive paper about, um, in that case, it's named PLAS. We renamed it from PLAS to PROS. So anyway, that's it. And I have people to acknowledge. and so. All of this work that I presented were by uh, one new graduate student, uh, Messi, uh, one postdoc, uh, Tajui, and a second graduate student, Ambush. Um, and then we have these uh, two external collaborators on these projects. And these are the two NIH grants that supported this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Wonderful the idea of moving from the sequence to dynamics to structures of uh, Are there any questions? We have uh, time for two questions. Hey, uh, sorry, thank you both. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, when you always compare it with Boson 62, which is. Uh, yeah. So you primarily uh, ref, uh, comparing uh, growth with uh, Boston 62 performance, uh, but this matrix is built on proteins uh, sharing 62 percent of sequence yeah. So I would consider, consider it not exactly fair comparison. Yeah. Why don't you <coughs> compare with Boston 45 or lower? We have done this. So, uh, and we could probably be more fair to present we, those to them. Yeah, the different the results are a little bit different, but we still show significant gains over each of those. The um, 
Um, and we show Blossom 62 because it's what most people use when they run glass. Um, but, you know, it's amazing how few people access the alternative parameters when they run sequence matching. Biologists just aren't um, geared up to understand what, how the parameters can change their results. I mean, you know, it's a naivete of sort. And the second question, uh, it's rather asking you for Omen. Uh, it's all beautiful, the results you presented. We've mentioned the, those remote homologs are sharing the same 3D structures. Have you observed them how big the false positive rate? Oh, it, how, how big the false positive rate? So, how many false positives you found, and what you observed, and potential reasons for them to be? So far, we've had very few. I, I don't, maybe it's. Five percent. I don't know that number. I should know that, but I don't know that. Um, uh, and, and we haven't paid much attention to that number because it's so few cases. Um, you know, we're we're typically looking at somewhere around a thousand sequences where there are unknown functions, and um, it's very hard to uh, validate those functions that you find. Uh, we. For the HIV cases, we've done literature searches, and, and even then, uh, we don't find all of them. We don't find known functions, experimentally known functions for all of those um, proteins. And so, um, it, validation is, is hard to do. We so don't know how to do it, well enough, so it's hard to know. Yeah. I'm sure we have fa more false positives than we know, but. Um, don't have a good way to identify all of them. So, right. Thank you. For the interest of time, we will we'll take uh, one more. Okay. And Robert, may I ask you to answer on the microphone so that people oh, sure. around the globe can sure. hear your answer? Hi, I have two sort of related small questions. One is uh, I know you just started to present the phylogenetic trees. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, if you were to describe the best or the, the best way to describe the difference between pro, uh, frost and uh, blossom 62, would that be that it is enriching the phylogenetic tree, kind of filling some gaps or holes? Well, you know, it, it, it means that you permit more substitutions and than you do with blossom, blossom series and matrices. And so, um, it, I mean, but. We're not doing this in a really correct way because you would like to actually account for the pairs explicitly, but instead we're just adding to the substitution for the single um, changes. So um, I'm not quite sure. So, 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 my, uh, so the related to the question is that uh, can we use the frost data to actually do ancestral sequence reconstruction? Um, you know, like uh, George Church's mammoth, you mean? <laughs> um, okay, I don't know. Um, I suppose you could try. I have. I don't know how to do that. So, um, sure. Well, I don't know. Thank you very much.